Then there's epiphany reports, uh, dream epiphany reports, um, you know, even more specific through dream reports, uh, historical stories, um, you know, reading a historical account of a historical account, uh, stuff like that, uh, a history or memoirs. Um, then there's also uh, heroic narratives, uh, whether uh, you know it's an, an epic or a cosmic, uh, an ancestral uh, narrative. Um, or we've got prophet stories, even comedies, uh, farewells, and different speech narratives. Um, I think, yeah, if you ever wanted to dig a little bit deeper into those, I would encourage you to, to research that, those a little bit more. Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, there's also a lot in the Old Testament uh, of legal material. Um, you know, as we're looking through Leviticus, or uh, yeah, especially Leviticus, there's a number of different types of law that you're looking at. Um, there's uh, casu casuistic law, um, or casuistic law, I guess. Uh, you know, it's in the if. Clause describes the case, uh, the then clause, you know, if and then. Uh, the then clause describes the penalty. So if this happens, uh, you know, then this is going to happen. So if we look, I'll just turn quickly to Exodus 21, 18 to 19 here. Page. Uh, if people quarrel and one person hits another with a stone or with their fist, and the victim does not die, but, it is con but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other can get up and walk around outside with a staff. However, the guilty party must pay the injured victim for any loss of time and see that the victim is completely healed. So there's a cause. You know, if this happens, then this happens, um, is the uh, ca casuistic law. Uh, there's also unconditional law, uh, you know, some prohibitions, you know, do not do this, uh, do this. Uh, if you do this, you're cursed, I guess. Um, and then also uh, particip participial sentences. I'm going to be more confident with that. <laughs> uh, legal series and legal instruction. And, and these ones generally address the audience personally um, as you're looking at that. Uh, the particip participial, participial, participial uh, sentences are generally personal crimes uh, if you're looking at that. Uh, the law, I think, is important to understand uh, as you're, we're looking at uh, any legal, oh, Old Testament legal stuff. You're looking at the law there's a lot of rules, a lot of uh, things, you know, as we came into understanding, you know, why did Jesus come, uh, you know, not to defeat the law, right? Mm -hmm. um, not, to abolish? not to abolish the law, but to, wasn't to complete fulfill. it, to fulfill it, yes. Because um, the law is actually grace. Um, uh, and I think we need to, when we're reading that, we really need to understand the law is actually grace. It's, it's set up so that it protects vulnerable people when, and it holds oppressors accountable. Um, it's not just to keep us from having fun, or it wasn't to keep them from having fun, but it was to protect the vulnerable and hold oppressors accountable. Um, So that's grace. Uh, then there's also, moving on, we have Old Testament poetry. You know, we discussed that a little bit last week. Um, there are different types of poetry, as we've looked at. Uh, there are prayers and songs. Uh, with prayers, there are, you know, we read through Psalms. There are like there are protest prayers, so, or prayers of saying, you know, God, why are you doing this? Like, stop it. Um, you know, royal protest, imprecate, imprecation, uh, penitential uh, psalms, and, and even dirges, uh, psalms of, you know, or prayers of, of sadness, of remembrance of, you know, people who have passed. Um, 
And then there are psalms, uh, which we see through psalms as well, uh, and through many of these different things. So there are thanksgiving songs, there are liturgies, uh, wisdom psalms, hymns, personal hymns, uh, coronation hymns, Zion hymns, Yahweh kingship hymns, uh, love songs, and royal wedding songs. Um, and so we can look at, uh, even just through Psalm 22, uh, in the structural art outline there, we can see a bunch of different genres, even just in how it's set up. Uh, you know, there's it starts as a protest. Uh, let's, I'm just going to turn to Psalm 22 here. Look at that. We're so close here. Starts with, uh, yeah, let's let's actually read that together. That'd be good. You're there. Perfect. Yeah. Psalm twenty-two. Psalm twenty-two. Um, Josue, could you read verses one and two? Mm -hmm. So this is a invocation protest. Uh -huh. I have the ESV. Yep. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Uh, and Lyle, would you mind reading verses 3 to 11? Kind of this report of a struggle. But thou, o holy, o thou that inhabitest in the praises of Israel, our Father trusteth in thee, they, they trust, trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a, war, a worm, and no man a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lips they shake the head, the head saying he trusts on the lord that he would deliver him yet him let him deliver him seeing he he delighted in him but thou art he that took me out of the womb thou didst make me no hope when i was upon my mother's breast i was cast upon thee from the womb, thou art my God, from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Uh, Bev, could you read from 12 to uh, 21, please? 12, many bulls compress, compress me, strong bulls of Bethlehem surround me. They open up, they open wide their mouths at me, like a raven and a roaring lion. I am poured out like a, like water, and all the bones are out of joint. Of joint, my heart is like wax; it is it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like pot pothurst, and my tongue sticks to the jaw. My jaws they lay me in the dust of death, for dogs. Dogs encompass me in company of evildoers and circles me. They have they have pierced my hands and feet. I count I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide their garments among me. For their clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. And you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My precious life from, from the power of the dog. Which, how far? Yeah, uh, at 21. Okay. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Yeah. 
so we see we've got this this protest, but also this petition of saying, you know, God, deliver me, save me. Um, and then he goes into, uh, David goes into verse 22 of this Thanksgiving praise. I'll read. So I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him. All you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. And so that's that Thanksgiving uh, hymn. And then... Close it off. Do you want to read that hymn of praise, 27 to 31, this way? All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Wonderful. So, yeah, so we can see see these different ways in, in which... Yeah, there are many different forms, especially in the psalms and the songs. Clearly, there's some different genres of music, you know, as we would say, uh, whether it's Thanksgiving or uh, different hymns and liturgies. Uh, and the way that we're, you know, it could be a sad love song or, uh, you know, just a getting, going, rocking worship song. <laughs> Um, so yes, wonderful. Let's move on to OT prophecy. Um, so there are some different types of prophecy as we'll be looking at here. Um, first of all, we'll look, we can look at uh, the prophecy of disaster. And I'll just read you uh, these two little uh, snippets here from Jeremiah 28, 13 to 14 says, Go and tell Hananiah, this is what the Lord says. You have broken a wooden yoke, but in its place you will get a yoke of iron. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will put a iron yoke on the necks of all these nations to make them serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. I will even give him control over the wild animals. So, Definitely not a nice prophecy uh, to good old Hananiah. Um, but there's also, uh, as we read earlier in that chapter, in verses 2 to 4, Hananiah actually uh, gives a, a bit of a bogus prophecy uh, to the people. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Uh, within two years, I will bring back uh, to this place, all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back uh, to this place Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Um, in this sense, we read a prophecy of salvation, uh, mind you, a, a false prophecy of salvation, um, but which there are other prophecies, I think, uh, uh, of salvation, even in uh, you know, 29, uh, uh, 11, um, you know, when, or 10 to 11, uh, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you. And, I, and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. 
Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And so yeah, so there's another uh, example of a prophecy of salvation of God, uh, of a prophet saying God is going to deliver us. Um, there's also uh, different types of prophecies of commissions uh, saying, you know, go and say this. You will go and you are going to you are going to say these things or, uh, calls to hear, uh, you know, hear this word as uh, some prophets are going to say. Um, and then there's also woe speech, you know, woe to those. Uh, I believe in we read a lot of that in, in Joel, I believe. Uh, as he is uh, addressing, uh, let's see here. These books are so small. That's why they call them minor prophets. Right. Yeah, either way believe me on this one, I guess. Uh, and then there are also uh, prophecies of, of a dirge, uh, addressing Israel as a corpse, you know, ready for burial, uh, as, as we find in Amos chapter 5. Um, doesn't sound like a great prophecy. Um, there's also uh, hymns, uh, liturgies, uh, disputations, um, Amos 3, verses 3 to 8, you know, does, uh, maybe let's just take a quick look at that one. I was just there, wasn't I? Amos 3, 3 to 8, it says, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Uh, does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it is caught when it has caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when no bait is there? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has not caught anything? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord, sovereign Lord has spoken, but who can prophesy? So, yeah, you uh, kind of disputing. Uh, God does these things. He's going to do these things. Uh, so when these things happen, uh, know that it is the Lord. Uh, there are prophecies uh, against foreign nations. First Kings twenty twenty eight um, prophesies against the Arameans uh, as as they are coming. Um, also, there are vision reports uh, as well as narratives and apocalyptic. So there are a lot of different uh, things that are found within prophetic uh, literature. I was just going to give you uh, there's a few eight different different ways in which I think we can look at pro prophetic books. Um, I think they can be maybe sometimes a little difficult for us to understand or try to even think through, you know. Oh, hello, hello. Hello, friends. How Welcome. are you guys? Doing well. Good. Come on in. Maybe grab a pen on your way if you don't have one. Cool. We're just talking about... Uh, <laughs> prophetic literature right now. Literature. Yes, old, old Testament prophecy. Uh, so we've just covered, we've just kind of finished talking about all the different types of prophetic genre. Um, and I'm just giving something that's not on your notes, but just a few uh, principles that you can follow when looking at prophetic literature. Uh, some simple things. So the best starting point for interpretation is to read 
you know, the whole book as a whole in one or two sittings, you know, become familiar with its main themes uh, and get a sense of its overall uh, rhetorical strategy as kind of the number one. Uh, second step, uh, it's a good discipline to, to record those observations. Um, so read through it entirely and then record your observations asking yourself, you know, why does this book develop the way it does? Uh, you know, we're not really, you know, specifically looking at, uh, or these principles are, are going to be applying uh, to prophecy, uh, but I don't necessarily know that they, uh, you know, maybe help you understand or answer the question, well, you know, what is this prophecy or how does it uh, pertain? But we'll get there. Uh, and then after some reflection, it says, list ways in which uh, the book's worldview may differ, uh, you know, from today. Uh, the question you want to be asking is, in what ways might the book wish to transform or perhaps even radically uh, our world, our worldview today? You know, how does this book want to transform our worldview? Uh, and then in light of the book's context, uh, we want to then focus on, you know, the smaller contexts, uh, you know, the verses, chapters, um, you know, noticing what it says, the themes, and also how it says it, uh, the literary forms, and then, and what, uh, you know, what it is about the how that gives the what its rhetorical power. Um, what is it about the how that gives the what its rhetorical power? Uh, and the ultimate goal should be to understand, you know, the major points of a prophetic book, you know, just like any book, I would say. Uh, and then uh, concerning fulfillments of prophecy, it says, number five, the Bible itself offers the best guide to determining, you know, which prophecies have been fulfilled during the Old Testament and the New Testament periods. Uh and it suggests patterns uh, for interpreting Old Testament prophecies today. So, sorry, then this is actually in your your notes, but just, that just, sense. just letting you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not on the notes. I'm just okay. giving you some general information. Uh, so the question is, when we're you know looking at specific prophecies, uh, is given its nature, when or did or will. Uh, a pro given prophecy most likely reach its given fulfillment or most likely reach fulfillment uh, in the Old Testament, New Testament, or or in the future, you know. So we need to be be looking at uh, looking at that. When is it, when should it have been fulfilled or when did it, when was it fulfilled or when will it, uh, is it going to be fulfilled in the future? Uh, and so in most cases, Old Testament prophecies about Israel and Zion uh, find their fulfillment spiritually in the church. Um, you know, as God is, uh, you know, as we're hearing, many, there's a lot of prophecies, you know, that about Israel and its fulfillment becomes, you know, the greater uh, people of God, which becomes the church. Um, so that's that spiritual element of it. But those that pertain more to a physical nation of Israel uh, may anticipate a future historical fulfillment. So whether that has been fulfilled or not is a good question. Um, and then with highly symbolic uh, apocalyptic texts, uh, we should first strive to understand the meaning of its main symbols and then to decide on the the whole text major uh, thematic points. So those would be like texts found in Daniel, where we need to uh, be looking at the symbols that he is being he's giving us. Because there are also symbols that are then repeated even in Revelation. Um, so looking at those, you know, what is the abomination of desolation? What does that mean? Um, where some Israelites would have assumed that to uh, the way it was described would have also attributed that to uh, King Antipas, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, he was the king at the time of the Maccabean Revolt. We talked briefly about the 
you know, first and second Maccabees, which are historical texts found in the Apocrypha, um, which kind of give uh, a bit of an understanding of you know, we call the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and New Testament. There's like 400 years uh, between those two. Um, and so there's the Maccabean Revolt, where uh, kind of a puppet king of Rome took over and did some horrible things uh, and then ended up really messing with Judaism at that time. And so the Maccabean Revolt kind of happened around getting rid of this king, killing him, uh, because he was doing some horrific things to the Jewish people. Um, and so they might have seen the, you know, the abomination of desolation being fulfilled in that king coming, or even Rome, or whatever it was uh, at that time, and feeling like that was the fulfillment of that. But that, but yet we see John also make mention of that same, or was it Jesus, uh, that actually quotes Daniel and saying, you know, the abomination of desolation is still to come in some ways, or that there is uh, when it comes. So there are those questions where we need to be looking at, we need to be asking. Uh, also, in the last one here, as for application, uh, we suggest a uh, student uh, find a situation in modern life uh, that seems analogous, you know, to the situation addressed either by a whole book or at least one section. Um, and so making sure that there's at least several key characteristics as part of, you know, your situation that you are comparing it to, not that it's just one, but that there's at least a number of different ways where you can say, well, yeah, that's like a similar situation. Um, and maybe we can apply some of those things here. Um, yeah. So moving on so that's uh prophecy we can now look at some old testament wisdom uh there are of which wisdom is kind of a big genre it can fall over many different uh books i think you know there are po there's poetry and wisdom and a lot of them kind of mix and fall under many different things so uh, it's hard to say that it's like a specific genre or that there's a specific type, um, but there are uh, there's wisdom literature nonetheless. So there are Proverbs, which is the obvious one. Uh, in Proverbs, there are many different types of, of wisdom. You know, there's descriptive and there's prescriptive. Uh, and there's also better than, you know. Better is, you know, such and such than to be in a house, you know, better it's to be living on the roof than to be in a house with a contentious woman. Those are always my favorite ones for some reason. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> I think those were before I got married, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and then there are numerical ones. Uh, you know, in Proverbs 30, 18, 19, it says three things I do not understand, you know. Uh, it kind of gives a list. Uh, and then there's also uh, antithetical Proverbs, uh, you find a majority in Proverbs 12, 25. There's also instruction, um, Proverbs 8, 33, you know, hear instruction and be wise, be wise. Um, you also see that in Proverbs uh, chapters 1 to 9. Uh, also, there are example stories, autobiographical, uh, in Proverbs 24, 30 uh, to 34, you know, an example. Uh, followed by a moral. Um, you know, this is the example. This is the wisdom to take from that. Uh, this example. There's also reflection, autobiographical, uh, disputation speech, hymns, uh, and avowals of innocence. So those are all different types of wisdom uh, subgenres, as we would say. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the Old Testament. Um, I will admit that I'm like a little bit less versed in Old Testament literature than I am with understanding the New Testament genres. Um, something I desire to grow better at and understand more as I go along my journey. But I have definitely really enjoyed getting into you know the different types of uh, literature in the New Testament. Um, and so 
we're going to be looking at uh, those now. So, first one is the Gospels. Uh, the Gospels, you know, it's a type of biography or narrative. You know, it's it's kind of a biography of Jesus. It's also a narrative. You know, here's the story we're going through. Um, but it is like one of a kind. That's the reason why it's its own genre entirely, is that there was never anything written that did all the things that a gospel does. There's no other type of literature that does it. And so they kind of, it kind of got its own name that this is, it's a genre, it's a gospel. It's not a letter that was written, you know, it wasn't just some apocalyptic uh, letter written, you know, it's a, what is it? Well, it's a biography, it's a narrative, it's a story. Uh, there's, you know, there's all sorts of different things. So they gave it the gospel uh, title, the good news. Uh, there are uh, the synoptics, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, there's also, uh, which I believe Mark was written first, uh, and then uh, Matthew and Luke would have taken source material from Mark, uh, which is why we'll find you know, very similar stories, similar wording uh, told in those Gospels. Uh, and then there's also uh, what we call Q, um, which is another uh, source material that is taken, you know, material found in Matthew and Luke, uh, but it's not found in Mark. Um, but it, there are also similarities, but it's, it's material that's similar in both of those, but that's not found in Mark. Um, and I think some of those, I think Q is mostly maybe not written, uh, necessarily written source materials, but like oral stories that were passed and continued general knowledge, essentially, yet at that time uh, that came in. So... Uh, those that was kind of another source material Q isn't like a real like document that you can find that it was sourced from it's kind of just the the name they call they give it as a other source um, the Gospels as we know in some of them it's not always written chronologically uh, as we read in the synoptics you know if you compare them across each other <laughs> There are stories that happen in certain places in one, and that same story happens in a different place uh, or at a different timeline in another. Um, so not always written chronologically. They should be read uh, horizontally and vertically. So horizontal in parallel with the other Gospels we need to be looking at, uh, but also vertical as, you know, through the passage itself looking at it and how it relates uh, to God. Uh, the Gospels are written to different audiences. Um, we've, we've said this, you know, covered that a couple times, I think. You know, Matthew's written to uh, more of a, a Jewish audience. Um, he is covering some very Jewish, you know, pieces in that uh, book. Uh, Mark uh, and Luke, I believe, are, are written more to a Gentile audience, or Mark is anyway. Uh, it's written more more to a Gentile audience. Luke is more of a historical uh, document, understanding, you know, trying to give a very historical account. Uh, that is like his purpose. Uh, and then John is writing for totally different reasons altogether, uh, showing a totally different story, not a totally different story because it's the same, but, uh, you know, writing it very differently. So they're written to different audiences. Uh, and so we should really make sure we're understanding the audience that it is being written to before we start uh, reading or while we are reading. There are also key theological issues in the Gospels. Uh, you know, we can look at, you know, what what is the kingdom of God? How do we understand what the kingdom of God is? You know, it's it's a reign, but not a realm, right? It's it's not like a specific section of area that is a kingdom. You know, it's the reign of God. It's his kingdom. But you know, it's also now, as Paul says, but not yet. You know, it's 
you know, Jesus even says, like, it's, it's here, it's in our midst, you know, you know, but it's not yet. The kingdom of God is yet to come. Uh, it's also, you know, personal conversion. Um, and then lastly, it's, you know, it's also spiritual, but it's not political, right? It's, uh, it's not a political kingdom, um, but it is a spiritual kingdom. There are also other uh, other key theological issues within the Gospels, especially like the et- the ethics of Jesus. Uh, Catholics, you know, they're uh, they're looking at you know only select disciples are expected, you know, to follow the more austere rules. So, you know, the <laughs> the higher you are, you know, the more strict it should be. But um, that there are specific rules that only you know, the select uh, higher disciples or apostles uh, should follow or need to follow. Uh, Lutherans, uh, Jesus' ethics are seen as, uh, you know, the law meant to drive us to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that's how they, they see Jesus' ethics. Uh, the Anabaptists, um, of which I derive my heritage from, uh, applied, you know, seriously to public life know and to all people on earth you know renouncing all violence taking a stance of uh, pacifism you know Jesus did not in any way condone violence um, or act in violence and so we should also uh, take you know a a stance of pacificity or uh, of nonviolence uh, you know so that that's one of their their big ones uh, the 19th century liberals uh, social, uh, you know, they had this social gospel uh, of human progress and, and moral evolution. Um, so that's how they're viewing the ethics of Jesus. It's just this, this social gospel. Uh, existentialists uh, look at the ethics of Jesus as, you know, Christ's teaching not being absolute, but it's a precedent for for ethical action. You know, that there's there's no moral absolutes. You know, Jesus was a great guy. He did some great moral stuff. Uh, great example as a, as a, you know, for morality or for just moral living, um, or for ethical action. Uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no moral absolutes. Uh, dispensationalists look at this idea of the kingdom uh, ethic, you know, as reserved for the millennial age of Christians. So they are seeing a. You know, a dispensation uh, is there's a there's a divide between Christians and Israel, uh, between God's people uh, as the church and and Israel. That it is actually being separated. Uh, that essentially God's promises, as we've moved into the New Testament, actually no longer reside on on Israel, but because uh, they have essentially rejected Him at this time and. It is now the church. So that's uh, more of a dispensationalist uh, understanding. And then, uh, you know, they're given uh, to everyone to to work on. Uh, these ethics of Jesus are just given to everyone to work on as a goal, you know, while growing in a relationship uh, with Christ. You know, we, we are striving to be more like Christ. And we, so we, we take his ethics and his actions and we strive to be more like him uh, as we uh, grow in a relationship with him. The Gospels also have different forms. They've got parables. Uh, you know, uh, when we're looking at parables, we want to recognize key points and key symbols with the main characters. Uh, it's really easy to kind of get into allegory, as we've talked about before, um, but we really I think the main thing as you're looking at a parable is to recognize the key point or the key main uh, the main point of the parable and the key symbols uh, with the main characters. So, yeah, still being careful with how we are engaging with allegory, even in parables. Uh, miracle stories uh, require us to be, you know, open to the supernatural, uh, and they're also pointers to God's kingdom. Pronouncement stories, uh, conflict, you know, Jesus with the, 
his, uh, the different religious leaders. Um, there are a lot of different uh, stories of those. And then other forms, there, there's legal uh, writings, beatitudes, uh, woes, announcement, uh, nativity, stories, uh, farewell, calling. Um, and so each of those you know, encompassed, is encompassed within, the, within a gospel and each kind of, we need to know how to work with each of those uh, or be aware of those as we're reading. Uh, moving on to Acts, is kind of written as this sequel to Luke. It's like Luke part two, um, the continuation of the gospel. And so as we've discussed before in like canonization of scripture, it was essentially the next book that had to be attached because it was the next chronologically sequenced book. Um, you know, written as a sequel, uh, it's, an, it's a narrative, focuses mostly on Peter and Paul, uh, the acts of the Holy Spirit moving among Jesus' followers as the church began to spread. Um, it is historically reliable, uh, as Luke has done a very good job in working to give us historical uh, reliability. Uh, parallels between Jesus in Luke uh, and Peter and Paul in Acts, as you will see just, I guess, uh, that's maybe something to explore as you're you're reading both and just seeing how they are taking Jesus' ministry forward. Uh, and then there's also uh, significance in uh, of Pentecost is, is central in Acts 2. Um, and so we need to also, you know, we've discussed a little bit of dispensationalism, but uh, we need to be careful to avoid the extremes of traditional dispensationalism and covenant theology. Uh, and so covenant theology is kind of the the uh, other side of, of the dispensational argument, saying that uh, through God's covenants with his people, as we've kind of moved along in history, uh, you know, Israel is actually part of... God bringing the church and is part of it. Um, and so as you're getting, if you start to look into those kinds of things, uh, just be careful as we're looking at, you know, the spirit of Pentecost. How do we understand who is a believer or who is, uh, yeah, who is a believer is uh, understanding, you know, that they have been, that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. That was kind of the mark. Uh, of being a Christian. Um, and so we need to also weigh those as we're exploring that. So third, the epistles. I do enjoy reading the epistles because I feel like they're an understandable genre mm -hmm. to like, yeah, to understand their, uh, just the general principles behind it. Because we really need to understand that, especially the epistles, they're occasional writings. They were somebody else's mail. Uh, so, yeah, you could... Candace was... Uh, as I was cleaning up my office today, I found uh, an old journal that I had written in when I was nine years old. Uh, I looked in it, and I had kept a daily journal, probably for a school project or something. And, uh, and so I was like, do you want to read, get into the mind of nine-year-old David, Candace? And so she sat there, and she read, you know, my old mail, essentially... <laughs> understanding, you know, she's like, man, it wasn't a really exciting life. She said, it's like every, every page is, we played hockey today in Okotoks. We won, played hockey today in such and such. We lost, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, uh, Canadian life. the Canadian life, the, <laughs> the life of a, of a youth in uh, minor hockey. Um, well, we're, lead, we're reading uh, somebody else's mail. Somebody else has written to somebody else for a specific reason. Um, and so uh, we need to yeah, be mindful of those, the audience and the author. You know, what are those things? Uh, what are the circumstances surrounding that? Um, debates about authorship frequently come up. Uh, six out of 13 of Paul's letters that are attributed to him are debated. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, debate Paul's authorship to the Ephesians. 
because um, in some of the original manuscripts, uh, I don't know if Paul, it, it seems like Paul's almost like superscripted or something like into it. Um, and then, but the fact that is, his theology almost seems different than the way uh, that it is in some other books. But did he write it at a later date is the question. You know, what, which imprisonment was Paul in when he wrote it? And has he, uh, you know, the questions are like, you know, as over time, does your theology change? Can it change? Can your writing style change and develop through that time? I think it can. And so uh, some of the, some of that stuff is debated among even the top scholars. So uh, there's also uh, structure. Um, there's always uh, generally a greeting, uh, an opening Thanksgiving, and then there's a body of, of information, and then a body of exhortation and commands, and then closing. And, and those can kind of jump back and forth as well between the different body ones but generally you know greeting opening thanksgiving uh, different kinds of information exhortation commands and a closing uh, variations if you see something different you should note it uh, pay attention to those things um, there's also subdivisions uh, exhortation letters in first thessalonians um, there's a, a diatribe i wish i could tell you and remember what a diatribe means but I apologize. Uh, letter of introduction, uh, recommendation in Philemon. You know, he's just speaking to a guy who he's never actually met, um, but he's kind of pleading to him on the case of uh, Onesimus. Um, and so he's, you know, introducing himself and giving a recommendation to him for how he should maybe live. Uh, and then there's also, you know, an apologetic letter of, of self commendation first um, Corinthians 1 to 7 uh, Paul saying guys uh, like apologetic letter meaning giving himself a defense um, you know saying he's not saying I'm sorry but he's saying guys you know I know you don't like me so much as you like uh, Apollo or uh, other guys um, you know they're better teachers in some ways um, but here's like my qualifications as an apostle uh, is what he's he's telling them. I like I'm qualified to do this and I'm giving you guys you guys also wrote to me. So like I'm writing you back and giving you instructions. So uh, just know that like I I know what I'm talking about in some ways. So he's kind of giving a defense of why he is an apostle uh, to the Corinthians. Uh, also, a you know, there's a family letter to the Philippians. Paul is saying, you know, I love you guys. You guys are my brothers, and I dearly miss you. Uh, and yeah, here's some things. Uh, there's three uh, species of rhetoric. Um, so there's judicial rhetoric, uh, arguing a case as as in court. Um, there's also uh, deliberative rhetoric, you know, it's, it's kind of relaxed and reflective. Uh, and there's also this epideictic uh, rhetoric, which is this like praise uh, or blame even, you know, you guys are doing so good or, man, you guys really step it up. You know, you guys have st stuffed this up. Um, and so you will see those things. And so we need to, to take a look at, at some of those. Uh, Hebrews and the general epistles. Uh, Hebrews is a sermon. Um, as, as you can see, it's a, it's a homily. You can uh, look through that entire thing uh, as, as a sermon. Um, James uh, is, is a complex uh, chiasmus full of, full of themes. Um, and so it can be a difficult book to maybe you know, take some of that stuff, because there's a lot of stuff happening in a short amount of time, um, but taking a look at all the different themes. Uh, First John uh, is also a, a sermon, a deliberative homily. Uh, Jude uh, is is a midrash, uh, or like kind of an Old Testament commentary 
would is what that would be. Um, the Pauline epistles, uh, as we've been talking about, uh, you know, there's some questions to be asked. Is there is there a unifying theme or unifying center of of Paul's theology? Uh, so as you're looking across all of Paul's writings, do you see his unifying theology? Uh, so stuff, that is something to really take a look at. You know, does Paul's theology develop, as I've said, you know, from one period of time to another? Is he therefore changing his mind? Uh, Galatians 1 and 2 and 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, I'll let you guys take a look at some of those. But essentially, Paul is, uh, I think in the, the second one, you know, Paul is looking like he's speaking of a lot of, you know, it's, it's like imminence. Like this is, Jesus is coming soon. You know, get things in order. Uh, you need to be, you know, we need to be prepared, which is like, great, we do. Um, but as I think at that point, you know, I don't want to keep making this comparison, but much like I am waiting for my child to be born, uh, you know, thinking, it's going to be soon, right? Well, Paul is also waiting, thinking Jesus is coming back, like, within our lifetime. Like, I'm probably not going to die. Jesus is going to come back. But then all of a sudden, he, you know, he starts going through life. It keeps going. And now, you know, reports are coming back that all the different apostles are being martyred. Uh, you know, people in their churches are passing away. And it's like, you know, as you're starting to get older and time is going on, it's maybe Jesus isn't coming back in my lifetime. You know, maybe maybe we need to be playing this playing the long game in in a sense. And so we do see Paul kind of taking a bit of a change uh, in some of his uh, books in that sense. And so so those are the epistles, the letters. Uh, and then lastly here, we can look at Apocalypse, uh, which we find in Revelation kind of being its own genre of literature, um, but also very much a part of uh, a, a type of literature that was written in, in different senses in the Old Testament, uh, like Daniel is an apocalyptic, uh, has apocalyptic uh, parts of it. Um, it's also... Uh, but Revelation is specific in some senses. It's an epistle written to seven churches, which is what we're going through right now uh, in uh, Brent's sermon series, which is pretty fun. Uh, so yeah, so there are specific letters in it written to those seven churches. It's also a hybrid of three genres as we're seeing uh, epistle. You know, what would these churches have thought when hearing this message? Um, you know, it cannot mean something. This is the thing with Revelation. And I actually... I need to study it more because I think I found it difficult or, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I think even a lot of pastors just, well, I don't really want to preach on Revelation because that's just opening a big can of worms in the church. Um, but uh, from a podcast I was listening to this last week, uh, about a couple of pastors are talking about it and they said, uh, you know, if a pastor really knows it well, uh, Revelation is actually really easy to preach on, and I think it was like First John is really difficult. Um, but if we don't really know what we're we're reading or looking at it, we think that First John is really easy and Revelation is really difficult. So, um, so I would like to get to a point where I can see Revelation as being something easy to explain. And I think it's important that we we understand that it cannot mean something that would have been incomprehensible to the original audience. Uh, an apocalyptic in its form uh, written to a specific people was always meant to be understandable for them, uh, incomprehensible for them to understand. Um, so it's not incomprehensible as we're reading Revelation. Uh, it's also prophecy, uh, as we see, it's a it's an apocalypse, or as we call a revelation, uh, is another word for apocalypse. Uh, you know, think of a political cartoon, is essentially the wording that comes out of it. Without understanding the historical context, the pictures are meaningless. 
you know, as I said, the abomination of desolation. I think the Israelites would have understood that uh, in some senses as being uh, part of that Maccabean revolt or part of, you know, with Rome or whatever that ends up being. But they would have understood that. And so we need to understand the historical context. Uh, Revelation promises God's intervention uh, into his people's dire circumstances, uh, assuring them of his ultimate victory over their enemies. So there are dire circumstances and God's coming to bring ultimate victory. Uh, it warns that in the meantime, things, things may go from bad to worse. Like, granted, I'm sure we're seeing some of that right now. Like, it, it's going to come. God's going to, it's going to come regardless. We know it's coming. And, uh, yeah, the question is, I guess, right now, what do we do about it? Do we do something about it? Or do we just continue and continue to share the gospel? And, um, yeah, maybe not the easiest of answers. Um, as to what we do in the meantime, uh, portrays uh, its message in highly symbolic and otherworldly terms, um, but it assures and encourages and warns God's people uh, in the midst of their trials. And so that is the apocalyptic. So I just have this one last note in the back here. It says, while general hermeneutical principles are able to be applied across each form of text, uh, it's important to take note of the special considerations needed when approaching each different genre. Because each genre has its own implications for interpretation when we enter into the text. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it was after last week when you said, you know, it, this, you were going to say it was boring, but it was the best one yet. And, and this one pulls out the You know, I, I left that. I was like, Dagon, it, Lyle, you're right. Like, I, I love, like, I love this. This, like, gets me excited and fired up when I'm talking about just, like, the intricacies of what the Bible is oh. and that there's so much more to be grasped and to, like, learn from. Uh, yeah, you can read it through once. But you're not going to get nearly anything. Like, you can read through it a dozen times. A dozen times. times. Different, different yeah. My grandma reads things. through it every single year, at least once. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's amazed every time. I love just listening to her talk about, I learned something new that I never saw before. You know, and she journals about it every day. And, um, and I think when we can take some of these hermeneutical principles, you know, it's going to help us to maybe get a clear and maybe more correct understanding, for sure, of, of Scripture. But it's definitely going to give us a fuller, uh, deeper understanding uh, as we read through Scripture, which only just leads to a deeper and fuller understanding uh, and relationship with God. So it's pretty cool. Any other comments? Things you found interesting? <laughs> I think the Gospels are more complex than I thought. Like right. They are their own genre and so many soup topics. That... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I want to reread re it now, understanding the context that it's kind of toy right. with and trying to even its original audience for yeah, each book like yeah, yeah and kind of understanding the audience that it's trying to uh, write to or yeah. talk about yeah yeah i i definitely uh i think where where i started to really get excited about this and just see the grander view of it and i've taken a few different specific bible courses but there was one uh, that I took when I was at CBC on First Corinthians, and it's like become my favorite book just because the teacher was so passionate about it, and he's like studied so deeply into just the context of who the Corinthians were, uh, that just understanding them 
as a people gave such a fuller understanding of what I was reading as a text and what Paul was describing, you know, their difficulties with, um, you know, why there was so much concern with food sacrifice to idols uh, or, you know, you know, meeting in temples that, you know, all those different things and just the difficulties that, you know, those people were, were dealing with in the context that surrounded their city uh, and their culture. Um, and so, yeah, once I started to get a really cool and deeper picture of those people in the historical context, it just makes the, yeah, when you get the understanding of who the audience is, uh, it just makes it so much clearer. And, and, the, and the author, you need to make sure that you take an interest in who is writing it and why. Um, one of, I don't know if you've listened or watched or heard of, uh, it's a movie video series right now called The Chosen. Uh, have you watched it or? I've watched like one or two episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of like a mini series, uh, movie really well filmed, honestly, really enjoy it. Candace and I watched it watch through it finally um i love the way that they portray jesus in it they they take a lot of uh artistic liberties necessarily in the in the story they fill in the gaps a lot they give the each of the disciples a backstory kind of thing um but one of the things they they kind of depict matthew you know they show right from the start his kind of journey as a tax collector before Jesus calls him. Uh, but they really depict him as being kind of, you know, he's he displays kind of he's on the autistic spectrum for sure. And like very good with numbers, doesn't, not you know, personal. not sociable, yeah. uh, doesn't really understand different social cues or why certain things are wrong and th certain things are right. Uh, and then they kind of play into that as to why they make a comment about him writing his gospel and how it's going to be pretty detailed. Like, you know, he's going to get everything right. Don't worry. You know? And so it was just funny seeing, you know, I guess understanding, you know, already having that understanding of the book and how things are laid out as to why they have casted a character, wrote his character in a certain way. And not that I'm saying that the videos enhance, you know, my understanding of scripture really, but you know, maybe they maybe they do help just give me a con contextual picture of what Judaism was in that day. Because I think they do a really good job of understanding historical Judaism at that time. So I'd encourage you to read or watch it. But uh, yeah, I started watching when it first came out. But I hate when you have to wait a whole week to watch the next. Oh, episode. don't worry, you can watch three seasons <laughs> now or that. something. So, but yeah, really cool. Uh, certain things like that can be good to just help us understand context because uh, other historians and people are trying to give that uh, as a visual understanding for us at this time. So we are blessed in some of those ways. Other than that, Lyle, would you mind praying us out?